I'm going to go ahead and start recording on my computer. All right, well, hey, everybody. This is the second day of Penny U Cafe Coffee Chats. Um, today, it's uh, I'm interviewing Max Walzenbach uh, from Provisions Group, and we're just going to kind of have a chat about his, uh, his work and what he's doing now, how he got into it, um, and what the challenges are, what, you know, any insights he has for, for prospective data engineers or data people uh, working with healthcare data. So thank you for reaching out. And I guess the only thing I want to start with, um, other than that intro, is, is just that Max and I haven't met before. Um, this is, he reached out to me yesterday and was like, hey, I'd, I'd love to chat. And, um, you know, so this is fairly spontaneous. And, uh, and I think that's really the power of having these like kind of one off, not one off, but these uh, human interactions and, and learning and, and conversing with each other. Um, because we don't know, we don't know who we don't know, um, so to speak. So thanks for joining Max. Could you, I guess, just introduce yourself a little bit and tell us a little bit about what you do? Sure, so I am a data engineer with Provisions Group. Um, we're a healthcare, mainly healthcare, um, consulting and recruiting firm based in Franklin. Um, for the duration that I've been there, I've been with pretty much one healthcare client um, working on uh, you know, any, any assistance I can lend them. We can get more into that later. Um, before that, I spent about eight years in uh, retail. So I was with Gap Inc, uh, San Francisco and out here, mainly in leadership roles. Um, and then I transitioned into an analyst role um, before I became a data engineer. Cool. And so, um, so you started your you started your career as in more of management, and then you moved into analytics, and then you moved into data engineering. Yeah, it was. It's actually a, a completely different field. Um, you know, in my old old life, so to speak, if you were really good at Excel, you were a technical wizard. So you know, that's. That's kind of how it was, but it was it was basically um, it was in the loss prevention department. So a lot of it was focused on uh, losses with the company, whether that was um, you know fraud investigations or employees causing loss. Um, it was pretty much figuring out uh, where there's potential fraud um, that could impact the business, and then investigating that, working with law enforcement. Um, so moving into more of a technical data engineering role was uh you know a totally different shift but i think that um people underestimate how transferable skills are so there's things that have come up in my career as a data engineer um even consulting that i would have never guessed would have um been helpful that i learned from you know my previous previous career um where i said wow you know i'm really proud i went through that previous experience because even though I don't have the technical expertise that someone who has been a data engineer for eight years has, you know, there's business skills and there's ways to like relate to, you know, upper management that I would have never had if I kind of stayed in a, in a technical role right out of college. Yeah. I, I love that. I think um, that's one of the things that I've learned in my career is, is just every, if you, if you invest in yourself uh, in whatever skill that you need at the time, it tends to come back and help in some way. Um, so what kind of, what, do you have a couple of those skills kind of at top of mind that have been really useful? <clears throat> yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I had an early mentor with that and he was the head of uh, cybersecurity, um, kind of global, uh, global loss prevention. And Gap was really big on, on mentor relationships, but the way that it works out, which I think is actually a really great model is, you know, as the, as the mentee, you own 51% of your own development. You know, the mentor is not responsible for your development. You know, you're the only one that's responsible for your development. So it's really up to you to kind of drive that uh, momentum forward. And so with him, our conversations were always based around, um, you know, he would say, okay, so what, what do you need? You know, and then he tries to provide that value. So I think one of the earliest things that's helped me in a kind of an unrelated way especially around analytics and when you're working with like a business user is asking the five whys. So, you know, you have a business user there, they say, I want a dashboard. And I'm sitting there as a data engineer saying, well, one, I don't really build dashboards too, <laughs> too often. I mean, um, let's see if we can get someone who's really good at Tableau to do that. Um, I can get the data there cleanly, you know, in a great data set. Yep. 
you know, but, but they don't understand those things. And so, you know, asking, so why do you want a dashboard? And then you get to a deeper issue. So why do you want that? Well, we can't get data. It's, it's, it's sporadic and this is how it comes in. We got to pull from this system and it's just, it's hard. And then I can kind of get to the root of, okay, so as a data engineer, what can I do to try to fix this problem? And then look into it and say, oh, they have an API. You just have to learn how to parse the XML. Okay, let me figure out how to parse the XML from this API to get it into, you know, SQL Server. And then we can make a really great dashboard from that from there. So I think that's, that's probably one of the biggest ones that's come up in my role um, uh, through relating to like, especially business users. Now, just out of curiosity, is, is asking the whys, is that what has pushed you into data engineering from like the management side? You start, or, you know, from more of the business mm -hmm. side, you're kind of like, oh, well, I want to do this. Well, I got to get more technical. I want to do this. I want to got to get more technical. I got to do this. And then finally, you're like, I'm at the source. I'm the root of the data. <laughs> I, I think it, I think it was, it, it, it's either that or it's, you know, wanting to, wanting to know the answer to something. And so you, you go and you go, you get stopped and you go, well, I don't know how that works. And then you want to go deeper and deeper and deeper. And I think, um, I think that's a really good point. Maybe, maybe subconsciously that was a part of it. Um, because before I became a data engineer with provisions, I transitioned from manager to an analyst role, uh, still with gap in loss prevention. But it was all Excel, and it was it, it, we wanted to, they wanted to keep it in Excel, basically because they they couldn't bring on a bunch of people who know more. So, and I think that's a business challenge that comes up a lot, is what I've seen. And so that was a big part of it was, well, I want to do more. You know, how how do I do that? And I, there was no answers for it because Excel wasn't the right tool for that. And I mean, Excel is great for a lot of things, but it's not great for building data models and and uh, <laughs> yep. And that sort of thing. So, um, can you talk a little bit about your technical development from, uh, you know, from Excel into whatever your whatever stack you're using now? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> first uh, in Excel, um, started getting into Power Query, um, which, if you are, <laughs> you know, someone out there needs needs Excel Power Query is a good tool, um, but um, then I, I, like you said, I wanted to do more. Um, so there was a three week jump start with Nashville Software School um, around data analytics. Signed up for that. Um, you know, Gap ended up sponsoring that for me, which was great. And that's where I got introduced to Python, um, got introduced to SQL, and really kind of saw the light at the end of the tunnel with those um, and how much uh, you, you could do. So that was really focused on the like pandas library and, and kind of the analytics side of it, but I really enjoyed it. And so started doing a lot of self-learning on my own, um, after that course. And then from that, um, is what prompted me to get a junior data engineer role with, with provisions. Um, and then since I've been with provisions, you know, it's, it's been really focused on Microsoft mainly. Um, and so haven't done a lot of Python. Um, I try to do a lot outside of work, but, um, day to day, it's really focused on Azure Data Factory and SQL Server. Um, and uh, man, I had no idea how much you could do with T-SQL and, and, and Azure Data Factory, but um, it, it's been a cool journey to, to learn about those. Yeah, so tell me a little bit more about uh, Data Factory, because I'm familiar with, uh, I, I followed a, a similar path where it was like, start, I was doing Excel, I was doing spreadsheets, and then I learned Python, did Pandas, I was doing data notebooks and stuff like that, and then, now it's like when you start wanting to serve data to people, well, you want a database server. And so you start learning, uh, in my case, it was Postgres, T-SQL. Um, and then what is, what is Data Factory's role in, um, in kind of the Azure ecosystem? Yeah, I would say, you know, Data Factory is kind of like the, <clears throat> it's a bridge to be able to build pipelines um, for someone who's not a hardcore programmer. So, you know, there's a lot of, um, things that they do for you, you know, like any GUI, right? You have things that they serve up that make it really easy, but because it's served up to you, it limits you and how you could do it. Whereas there's folks who are really good at Python who could whip that up really quickly because it's, <clears throat> it's like that. And there's a lot of freedom with it. Data factory, you know, it has really good models and there's things in there that kind of, um, I guess it makes it so that it catches 
things that people in the past might have gotten stuck on, and then it fixes some of those common issues for you and kind of serves it up. Um, when you're working with really unique um, things, it can be more difficult because you got to figure out a lot of work uh, ways around it. But um, you know, it, it's really a GUI to build pipelines. Um, I think there's a lot, lot out there. You know, Talon um, is, is a popular one for some companies, and um, I think Amazon Web Services has one called Glue, but I'm not too familiar with it. But it, it, it all kind of comes down to the same thing, where <clears throat> it's drag and drop, and then you kind of customize how you want your um, your pipelines to flow. But there is a lot of connectors in there and things that could kind of help help uh, get your data from A to B and transformed how you want. And typically, <clears throat> doing, um, I guess you could have your the A it could be like an application system. Uh, or it could be the database self-referencing itself, right? So it could be a transformation from within the database to some other like schema two, schema one to schema two or something like that. Yeah, it could be, you know, if you, moving data between servers, it could be um, uh, a common one that we see right now for healthcare is you get a data dump, you know, you get something in a CSV um, and uh, it gets dropped there from another company or from a vendor every week. And, you know, you got to load that into your data warehouse in order to use it for analytics down the line. So that's a super common um, case um, that pops up. Um, but it also, there's some interesting ones that we've done as well. So, you know, I just finished a pipeline where we're pulling from um, the government's uh, Medicare database. They have an API. And so, you know, we have a list of all of our doctors. And so, you know, we pull in the list of all of our doctors and then we dynamic, dyna Data Factory helps facilitate us to dynamically build um, an API call, which returns JSON. And then in SQL, I parse out the JSON into our data warehouse. And so what that ends up doing is we have up-to-date information on all of our providers that we can match against um, our data that's manually input from a front end system, you know, at a center, at a hospital somewhere, um, to ensure that we have the right data. So that kind of helps with some of that data integrity. So you can do really interesting things that that at least um, I thought were uh, were pretty cool. Um, so I have kind of a professional interest in healthcare data, um, and so I want to. I do. There's a couple of things I want to unpack there, but um, can you talk a little bit more about what? Uh, maybe some of the patterns that you see in healthcare data and like and how stuff needs to get moved that are different from when you were at GAP or uh, like is there any anything that has surprised you about healthcare uh, working with healthcare data that you had an experience? Um, surprised me the complexity <laughs> for sure. Right. Um, yeah you know I, I mean I haven't gotten too much into like the the billing, the transactions, um, you know, refunds, payers, and all that. I have some you know exposure to it, but um, that's really blown me away is how complex um, that can get when you have so many different payers. You have so many different insurance companies. Um, oh, AirPod fell out. There we go. Um, and then you have uh, you know all it takes is is you know. Um, you have thousands of employees entering data in a system. If one person spells Tanova with one N and someone spells it with two, now you have a data integrity issue. And if you don't have things in place, that can really throw things things off when you're looking for, um, you know, um, refunds and payments and all that. So a um, lot of complexity. I think the biggest thing that I've seen with healthcare that's not too, too different um, with uh, um, okay, it looks like Scott shares my shares my pain, <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, the thing that's not I work I worked with some Vanderbilt data before, and even things that you would think, even things that are standardized, like uh, you know ICD nine codes and ICD ten codes, there's so yeah. much overlap of you know like they could be one doctor may code it as you know some pneumothorax lesion. I'm kind of making this up, but then like another doctor may code it with the left side or the right side, and so you have all of this. You have both like redundancy and hierarchy and <laughs> even within like the standardized accepted codes, uh, it's, it's wild. Yeah. But, you know, being the optimist, what is good about it is like, uh, like duplication 
um, you become really, really good at building a lot of checks and balances in your process to make sure that you don't get duplicates <laughs> and that, that throws things off. I found that um, often, but um, you know, I'm, I'm still learning uh, a lot. There's a lot to learn. Um, I think the other thing that, that I've focused on a lot in the past year is automation of registries. So there's, there's a ton of registries out there that aggregate this data from a lot of different companies mm -hmm. for different purposes. You know, there's some that focus on GI um, and colonoscopy. There's some that focus on joint uh, surgeries. There's, you know, some that focus on all these different types of things. And so oftentimes you're, you're limited um, or the company would be limited on how they can get that data in order to, you know, improve their service, right? Improve patient quality. They're limited because that registry isn't set up, you know, <laughs> they don't have a whole team of data engineers who are preparing this data and sending it out. They probably have one vendor that they outsource or they have one guy who kind of knows a little bit and, and can and arrange it and push it out. So it often comes in really messy formats um, mm -hmm. where they might give you a JSON or they might give you an XML, but it's, it's uh, not formatted in a way that you can just take that and start to um, ingest it in your process. And so um, I've done a lot of work um, with that um, where we've, um, we, get, we get this data and it's really messy and you have to build a process to automate it, to ingest it <clears throat> and get it in the database. And that's been really uh, super interesting, both from a, from a healthcare industry point, point of view, but I think for me selfishly, it's been really interesting because those super hard projects are the ones where I learn. Right. You, you learn so much because there's so many little like concepts that you pick up through an experience that otherwise you wouldn't have, wouldn't have gotten. Yeah. So how, how do you, um, how do you kind of evolve your, uh, how do you make sure that you don't have to keep revisiting the same issues over and over and over again? Like, I think, well, you know, one of the things that um, strikes me as being different from, from data science or data analytics and in data engineering is you have to build the robustness into it. And that's, that's uh, I feel like it's a hard earned skill. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, what your approach is when you're building one of these pipelines and like, are you thinking with tests, are you testing, uh, everything as you go or what, what practices do you have to make sure that you don't have to keep coming back to the same thing over and over again? Yeah. Um, well, so I've been doing this, I'll, I'll caveat this with, I've been doing this a little over a year. So I, I definitely am not going to promise that <laughs> my process is, is uh, you know, going to be the best. And I'm sure a lot of other people have, have better processes that um, I could learn from. But for me, um, you know, obviously there's some basics. Um, setting up a test environment, replicating everything in the test environment, and then um, just starting, I think just jumping in and getting my hands dirty, so to speak, with the data is the most important thing because, you know, you want to build this really big query. You start with the inner query and you run that, you see what you get, and then you go, okay, that's not right. I got to tweak it. And so you, it starts to add up, you know, and then soon you have a fairly complex um, uh, you know, query, I, I think it, it starts there. Um, so I, I think just jumping in, getting your hands dirty, tr trying to understand the data and where you want to go with the data in the beginning is really important. That's a lesson that I've learned the hard way many times is um, sometimes I want to jump in and start building the pipeline and, and data factory. And I have to take a step back and say, I need to plan out what I'm trying to do because at a certain point, I'm going to get stuck, <clears throat> and then it's going to be so complex. I'm not going to. Sh I'm not sure. You know, I get kind of lost in my own process, and so I think it's it's in, that planning part is really important. Um, the other thing for me that's helped a lot, especially being relatively junior, is having someone who's like an architect who I can go to in the beginning of the process, throw it out there. They can throw out their ideas about how they think it should be built. Then I dig in. I start to see is this going to fit what our original plan is and where you most often the answer is no, you're going to have to tweak something. So you go back, you tweak it and then you, you build it out and you kind of do a check in the middle. So, okay, so it's running. Are we, are we sure this is right? Let's do a lot of QA and testing for it. Um, and then it's really, we're not going to put it, push it to production yet. We need to wait a couple weeks, get a, get some more sample data in here 
um, see what breaks and what doesn't because I think the first pipeline I built in this role uh, ran it. I, I thought I was really clever because there were like comments in there and people had um, tick marks and everything. So, you know, my escape characters for it didn't work um, and it, everything <laughs> broke. And then so I was like, okay, that's not going to work. Um, you know, especially when you're dealing with comments, right? Like any right. characters could be put in there. And then so, um, you know, it took a couple iterations of that process and a lot of sample files to really land on, okay, I think this escape character is going to be the best for us. Um, and then, you know, it runs for three months and you don't have an issue. So it's a lot of failure, um, some success failure, but I think like, you know, I imagine it's probably the same with more of a heavy programming role where you kind of ride that roller coaster of frustration um, you're stuck, you're stuck, and you get a little bit of success, it pushes you onward, and then you have some more frustration, um, and then eventually, you know, the light bulb goes off, and it runs correctly, and you don't get an error, and you're like, oh, okay, this is, this is great, and then you don't trust it, so you keep testing it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, yeah, you start, you start to doubt reality by the end, and then, and then finally, you just kind of accept it and, and move on. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, does anyone in the audience want to ask a question? Any, any um, you know, we've got a couple minutes left. Uh, we're definitely gonna stop by 9.30, <clears throat> but uh, if anyone has uh, something they wanna ask Max, feel free to. Cool, then I wanna ask a question about, oh, here you go. Um, so Max, do you have uh, experience in AWS? And if so, can you compare it to Azure? So I don't have any hands-on experience with AWS. It's, it's something that I started to look at um, when I was first kind of getting into the role. Um, but based on um, some of my colleagues who work a lot in AWS, um, they've told me that Azure is, is kind of, you know, uh, Azure has, in Microsoft, has a lot of tools that they kind of build for you, like SSIS, um, you know, tools where it's GUI, you can drag and drop. They try to make it easier for you to do some of these things, whereas my understanding with AWS is most of those pipelines that I would typically build in Data Factory, you would, you would make in Python. So it's kind of more focused on, on that. And that's one of the reasons I've been trying to learn Python outside of work, because um, I want to know how to build this pipeline I built in Data Factory in Python. Um, so, um, so that's my understanding. Yeah. So I, uh, I I think you can unmute now if anyone wants to to jump in. Um, I know for me, I learned AWS first, and it AWS is definitely overwhelming. It feels like a zoo uh, a lot of times, but then it, it seems like Azure has a lot of integration. It, everything. It feels like the components work together a little more tightly. You know, like you said, SSIS. It's like Data Factory plugs into SSIS, and that plugs into SSAS. And then, it, it, if you can figure out the acronyms, uh, then then you could probably piece together something pretty tight. But um, it, figuring out the acronyms is, is tough. That's true. Of, that's true of uh, I guess both services. Are. And I think that's that's kind of a dilemma there, right? Is that um, you could learn a lot of things, but not have a lot of depth in it. So you could learn AWS and Microsoft and all these different stacks and not have a lot of depth, or you, uh, your learning could be more like a T, you know, where you go really deep in one area like Microsoft. And so I, I think that's a dilemma. I don't know if one way is better than the other, and I'm not quite sure which way I want to go yet, but, um, it does make it easier if you work in just Microsoft for a while you get to, you get used to kind of how they like they tend to arrange things how do you manage the tension um between going like doing something more novel um you know like trying to roll your build your own pipeline in python and using something that's going to get you faster results that you know already like data factory yeah i think if it's a if it's a business focused thing where we need to add value really quickly I'm going to use the tool that um, that I know can do that the fastest and the most accurate, especially with healthcare accuracy, super important. So um, that's where I'll tend to do that. Um, I think, um, but
but I think if it's her fun and it's just something that I want to be challenged with, I'll try to do it the harder way because I'll learn the most. Um, that said, it's interesting. Um, I'm taking some online classes around data engineering now focused in Python and the concepts are totally the same though. You know, how you build a pipeline in data factory, um, it's, it's very similar. It's okay. We need to look up the data that we need and then we need to do a, you know, for each loop on each of the, the data. And then within that loop, we're going to do these things. And then, so when I'm writing Python, it's, it's super similar. It's just different terminology. It's different, um, you know, ways that you arrange it, but the concepts are kind of translate well. Right. Um, all right. Chang asks, where do you find data pipeline examples on the internet? I think this is a great question because it's, um, it, every data pipelines are, are pipelines. Like you have to roll your own because it's kind of a custom thing. And so finding, something that matches the data and then what you want to do with the data uh, templated on the internet is kind of tough sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think some, some places have a lot better resources than others too, for sure. Um, so, it, you know, from an open source like Python, AWS, I think there's a lot of really good examples out there um, for Microsoft. You know, you have to rely on <laughs> Microsoft's learning or, or a few others. I will recommend, you know, they don't post too often in it, but there's a data engineering subreddit that um, I found really helpful. Um, and they've in the past posted really great examples uh, where um, start to finish how they would develop something in Python or the example of how, you know, Netflix works with their big data um, with, you know, Hadoop or whatever um, to, you know, scale. Um, so um, I, would, I would say that. Awesome. Um... Any, any kind of, does anyone in the audience have one last question they want to ask? Do, 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 going once, going twice. Okay. Um, is there anything, any, any last words you'd want to say to like a, an aspire, someone who's in analytics that wants to, to transition to data engineering? What would you, um, what would you recommend? I think the most important thing is, is to be curious. So if I had to pick one thing that, you know, got me into a junior data engineer position and then subsequently, you know, a regular data engineer position, it's, it's being curious. So even if you're, if, even if you're a contractor and you're at a client, you know, don't wait for them to say, here's what I need you to do, you know, do those things first, of course, but then think about, well, how do you get, you know, if you're talking to someone, how do you get that data? Where's it come from? Oh, okay. So is it frustrating to get it in that way? Are, are there ever times you wish it was a different way? You know, if, if you had the perfect process, what would it look like? And you sort of ask those questions, you know, and you, you get really curious around it. And then from there, I think, um, you know, you find, like I found these areas where I go, oh, I know what that is. And I think I could, I could do that. And then, so, you know, then you just progress and, and obviously it's good for the business because you're fixing processes, but I think for yourself, it ends up, you know, that curiosity, you, you learn an exponential amount, you know, I mean, you one year of experience varies drastically across the board for people, you know, that that could be five years of ex equivalent, five years of experience for someone else. Um, it just depends on I think, you know, I think curiosity is a really, really big part of it. That's awesome. I love that. Um, just follow keep following the, the breadcrumbs uh, to where <laughs> to wherever they go. Um, well, thank you, Max. This was really awesome. Um, I really appreciate you reaching out to me and then um, I really enjoyed this conversation. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll post it online and we'll see, we'll see kind of what happens. We had seven people, which is pretty great. Yeah. Th thank you so much. I mean, this is a really cool tool. And like I said, I've just recently jumped back into Penn University and just reading through all the old threads. Um, it, it seems like a really awesome um, place. And it, it's one of those resources where I, I really wish that um, you know, I was like, man, when I was first interested, I wish I just, this just appeared on my computer because this would have been a wealth of information. So I right. appreciate all your efforts and what, what you're doing for those that might be up and coming and interested in the field. Yep. That's what we're here for. I was in the exact same place. That's, that's what happened with me. <laughs> it was like, oh, this is, this is a great resource. <laughs> um, all right. Well, thanks, Max. Uh, have a great day. Great. Thanks. You too.